Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a show business trailblazer. She was one of the first women to have a successful career as a television comedy writer in an industry overwhelmingly dominated by men. Back in the late 60s, and despite being the youngest runner-up for a prestigious Writers Guild Award for a script she'd written in graduate school, the only open door for a female writer in Hollywood was as a secretary. She worked her way up to be producer of a TV show starring comedian Mort Saul, and then got hired as a casting director on the groundbreaking TV show Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. When the show's producer, George Schlatter, refused to allow a woman to join his writing team, offering her a job as a writer's assistant instead, she pivoted into the world of TV sitcoms and never looked back. She wrote for some of the most iconic shows of all time, including The Mary Tyler Moore Show, The Bob Newhart Show, Maud, The Partridge Family, The New Dick Van Dyke Show, Square Pegs, and many more. In fact, our guest wrote the episode of the Mary Tyler Moore Show called The Square-Shaped Room, which won Ed Asner an Emmy Award. She also wrote TV movies, including The Couple Takes a Wife, starring Paula Prentice and Bill Bixby, and The Girl Who Came Gift Wrapped, starring Karen Valentine and Farrah Fawcett. She's one of the founding members of Women in Film, and she's taught comedy writing at the Television Academy and lectured at the Paley Center and at numerous universities. She's appeared on TV many times on CNN, HLN, and the Today Show, to name only a few. She's had her own weekly radio commentary on Robin Hood Radio called Susan Says, and she's written op-ed columns for the New York Times, and for four years, she wrote a highly entertaining column about dating called The Search for Mr. Adequate on NewYorkSocialDiary.com. And finally, in 2017, she released her brilliant, hilarious, sometimes salacious, and very <laughs> insightful memoir entitled Hot Pants in Hollywood, Sex, Secrets, and Sitcoms. This book was such an enjoyable read that I hated to get to the last page. And let me tell you, the episode describing a highly unusual medical <clears throat> event resulting from a particularly satisfying encounter with a vibrator is most definitely worth 10 times the price of the book. Trust me. <laughs> and with that said, I'm delighted to welcome oh. the fabulous Susan Silver to our show. Susan, thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's over. I can't top that. Goodbye. I just, first, let me apologize. I have a cold, so I sound a little hoarse, and I'm not a horse, but hey. And my t-shirt says, I was social distancing before it was cool. I didn't leave the house for two years. I left the house and I got a cold. See what happens, Harvey? I know. I understand. But we really appreciate you being here. You said in your book that you write to make sense of life, to examine it, and then have some control over it. What did you mean by that? I think it's false, the false premise that one can have control over your life. But you can make sense of it. When I wrote the book, first of all, you write it and you don't think anybody's going to read it. So you're totally honest and you say everything. And fortunately, my parents had passed, so they didn't have to read about it. It's not salacious. It's naughty, the naughty stuff. And I don't know, somehow I learned about myself. I learned that I'm a lot more resilient than I thought I was. The three R's, I call them, relationships, most important thing in life, reinvention. You have to do it every 20 years. And I saw that I did it. And resilience. I never thought I was, but I was the kid who, if I broke a nail, I'd cry. But I got through cancer and death and a few other things, as well as the fun stuff. And you see your life in a different way, and it gives you a sense that you have accomplished it, and I'm still here. Well, you're more than still here. I mean, there's so much in that book beyond the comedy. You know, you wrote about your rather complicated relationship with your mother. You said that she lived through you, both exalting in your success, but at times also resenting it, which leads me to an episode of Maud that you wrote where Maud's daughter goes to a therapist how much of that episode was inspired by your relationship with your mom? Everything. The reason I could write Maud was she was my mother. B. Arthur scared me and my mother scared me. And that episode, when I went in and pitched it, was my life. When I told my mother I was going to therapy, she said, you're going to blame everything on the mother. I said, of course. And I did. <laughs> and it's true. 
the mother-daughter relationship was very pivotal and very difficult and yet wonderful. I miss my parents every day. I learned a lot about my mother. When I did have a, a scare with a with a lump in my breast, she came out to stay with me in California. And at one time we were both crying and she said, you know, I have a life too. And I realized that her whole life had been sort of about me as the only child. She was, mm, let's say, thwarted in her own career thing. She got married. She got married very late. I was the only child I was like focused on. And I learned a lot about her and, and we made peace. I'm very interested in what drives your sense of humor and your creativity. You said in your book that you have an almost pathological inability to tolerate ambiguity. Wow. How did that affect your creative choices as a writer? That's so interesting. You know, when I was a child, there was a very famous story, a book called The Lady and the Tiger. And, and the answer, you didn't know which door was going to open. Would it be the lady and wonderful or the tiger in danger? And I couldn't stand not knowing. Sometimes when I read a mystery, I look at the end <laughs> to see its resolution because I can't not know. And in life, I guess I, I always want a definitive answer. As far as the humor goes, I've always been funny, mostly to um, entertain myself. I'm very easily bored. I was an only child, so I kind of lived with my dolls and myself, and I made myself laugh, and it's a way to get through life. I, I can't help but laugh, even when I was in the hospital and things were going on. I, I always look for the funny side, and I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to do that. I feel for people who can't, and that's why I think comedy is so important in our lives. Oh, very much so. Now, Susan, as I mentioned in my introduction, you started your career in Hollywood at a time when the term sexual harassment had not been invented yet. Tell me about the sexism you experienced as a young woman in the industry. You know, it's so funny with the Me Too movement. I asked a couple of my friends from the past, did I miss? I mean, was I not gropable? I, I didn't have many of those incidents. I did escape, uh, escape the three biggest gropers in, in the world, Bill Cosby, which I talk about in the book, which was kind of, which would have ruined my life. A couple other people that won't be mentioned. Harvey Weinstein didn't like me, period. But it wasn't as, I think for actresses, it was more difficult. For writers, we were treated as less than, we were treated as secretaries. They always say, were you the secretaries? No, we're the writers. But it wasn't as difficult. I never had to fight anybody off. Let's put it that way. I think I was very, very fortunate. Plus, I was married at the time, which maybe gave me that escape route. And I had a big mouth. Maybe that had something to do. But although there may not have been, you know, sexual assaults, there's no question that many producers you dealt with were sexist, they were dismissive, or they were just plain rude. No, this is true. We uh, The worst thing ever was a, a very famous producer, James Comack, Courtship of Eddie's father, my partner, who was a right, uh, was a woman also, we went in for the meeting and on his wall, there were pictures of breasts. So that was like unsaid, but the most disgusting, intimidating thing. And he asked if we were the secretaries. We said, no, we're the writers. And and we had a couple incidents like that. And when I was on laughing, um, my boss wouldn't let me be a writer because I, I said this in the New York Times, there was an article because I was a girl. He said, you can't be a writer because the guys are all on their underwear in an apartment and they're farting. So I said, well, that's okay. And he said, no, 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 they don't want to fart in front of you. So when I told that to the New York Times, I thought they'd say, oh, passing gas. Or, no, they said farting. So I got the New York Times to say farting, which I consider a great accomplishment. Well, you know, it's really quite shocking looking back and seeing where we've come. At your first Mary Tyler Moore show taping in 1971, the producer introduced you to the studio audience. And after praising your writing skills, he complimented your legs. That's just shocking. You know, at the time, I was so, I was so thrilled to be there and I just took everything as a, as a wonderful thing. And TV Guy did an article because I actually, and I wanna say this to everybody, the title of my book, Hot Pants in Hollywood was not my behavior, it was my wardrobe. I, I wore hot pants to a meeting once. I am so sorry, feminist. I don't know why I did it. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. And TV Guy wrote an article and put a picture and then, oh, but it did make my career. So there you go. We were a little different back in the day, we weren't as woke. Let's put it that way. 
You wrote that you were never good at ego stroking. Was that a problem in your career? It's a problem in my life. What are you talking about? I'm looking for a new husband and I can't find one because I don't know how to do that. I think that's one of the reasons. I, I'm, I'm a Sagittarius and we have three qualities that I find are me. I love to travel. We need our freedom and we tell the truth too much. And I do all of those things. I think that's what makes you so likable. Yeah, you're in the minority there, but thank you. You either like me or you hate me. Let's put it that way. I want to ask you about your time working on Laugh-In. You wrote that George Schlatter, who recently appeared on our show, scared the life out of you. Why? He was a little on the mm, crass side, and he didn't he didn't take no for an answer. And I was doing casting, and in those days, you had to get everybody on the show, and everybody wanted to be on the show. But during my honeymoon, I was like running down the beach in Maui after David Jansen, asking him to come on the show. And then a couple other things that I talk about in the book, he didn't like it if I couldn't get the guests, and you had to like say or do whatever and he was not the easiest guy his partner ed friendly was more in my corner now eventually with the help of gary marshall you began writing for sitcoms you described gary as one of the hardest working and most beloved people in the business a real mensch tell me about your friendship with gary gary was my best friend and responsible really for getting me into the business. And then he also was responsible for getting my ex-husband into the business. Gary did Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and The Odd Couple. And he had started a group. He, he took care of his whole family. Penny Marshall was his sister, his father. He started a group of young writers for his father to manage. So he had a job. And my partner, Iris Rayner Dart, who went on to write Beaches, was a, a client. And she said, I'll introduce you to Gary. And then we did a Love American Style and she took a break to have a baby. And I saw the Mary Tyler Moore show and I said, oh, Gary, I can do this show. I'm from Milwaukee. She's from Minneapolis. I worked in a small TV station. So did she. So, well, let me see if I can get you in there. And the only reason they saw me was because Gary said he would back me. So it really was starting on top. And he he became my my best friend. And then he dropped me as a client when I was at the height of my career because I was taking up too much time and I I remember saying, you know, it's that that gone with the wind moment. You'll regret this. And, and, and then, of course, we became best friends again. And he hired my husband, who was a stockbroker, to be a junior writer on Laverne and Shirley. And my husband became very successful writer and producer of Married with Children. So there you go. Well, I know George Slaughter was wrong to refuse to let you be a writer on Laugh-In. But that rejection pushed you in the direction of writing for sitcoms, which you were much better suited for than a variety show, don't you think? Totally right. You're so you're so right. Because back in the day, variety show people were all in one room, like they do now, writers' rooms, and you're yelling and competing and throwing jokes up against the wall. And that's not the way I write. Um, when I wrote sitcoms, we would meet with the producers. We would have an all-day meeting on Mary Tyler Moore, other places, 20 minutes. Then you'd go home and you'd write the outline, you'd get it okay, then you'd go home and you'd write the first draft alone. And I, as I said, I'm an only child. I'm used to being alone. I love writing in my room at night. I wrote from seven to 11 at night, which is maybe why I'm divorced, but who knows. And yeah, it was, I wasn't a variety kind of gal. In fact, Lauren Michaels had asked me to be on Saturday Night Live and I just, I couldn't do it because I don't like that competition yelling thing. Well, can you take us back to the first time you watched actors speaking the lines that you wrote, bringing your dialogue to life? What went through your mind? This is so funny that you say that because the really the first time was in college. I went to Northwestern and I was a showgirl on a very famous show called Wah Mew, a very famous Northwestern show where a lot of Chicago, very adult and great comics came And I also wrote a sketch and I was standing backstage and I heard the audience laughing at my sketch. And that's when I said, I have to be a writer. I want to do this. So from then on, yeah, it's exciting. And sometimes they don't say it the way you like, and sometimes they make it better. So there you go. What did it feel like to see your name on the TV screen at the end of the show when the credits are rolling? That was exciting. That's, that's still exciting. And Talk about mother, going back to the mother thing. I always win the contest of whose mother really zinged you. 
when I was in TV Guide, I called my mother. I said, Mother, there's this fabulous article about me in TV Guide. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. Are you on the cover? <laughs> so it's called, you, you can always get an A minus, but you can never get an A. <laughs> Your mother and mine must have been similar, because when I told my mother I was appointed a provincial judge, she said, well, what does it take to go to the Supreme Court? Oh, see, there you go. Yeah. Now, in, in writing about your time on the Mary Tyler Moore show, you said that unlike the ambiance at most sitcoms, which was like a war zone, the atmosphere on the Mary Tyler Moore show was absolutely wonderful. What made it so special? The guys, Jim Brooks, Alan Burns, Lorenzo Music, David Davis, they were the execs and the, and the two script supervisors. They were so kind, they were so warm, they were so wonderful, and they wanted a woman's point of view, which hadn't been told before. There's a new documentary coming out on HBO called Being Mary Tyler Moore, which Lena Waithe is doing, and I, I hear myself in the promo saying, women have different lives, we talk differently, we, we think differently, we say different things. And Jim and Alan were very interested in that. And they were also, and Lorenzo and David were so kind to me. I was so scared when I went in there. I was like shaking and they laughed at everything. You know, it's hard. You have to pitch your stories out loud. You have to be a performer and everything. And I'm like, my ex-husband was a really good writer, but he didn't like that. So he got a partner. You know, some, some writers are really good, but they can't pitch their stories. And it's hard. And these guys were just so welcoming and lovely. And, and, and then I was spoiled because I started on that show. And then it never was as good after that. You described Mary as wonderful, but remote. In what way was she remote? It's so interesting when, when I think when you see the documentary, you'll, you'll realize why well, she had a very troubled, painful life. She was, she had a wall around her. She was very friendly and very dear. In fact, in New York, I moved, I was two doors away from her and I would see her on the street. Her husband's doctor's office was in my building but you could never really get close. And they talk about that a lot in the documentary. She had a, a lot of pain, personal, in her life, and she just kind of built a protective wall around her. I thought your comments about Ted Knight were really interesting. You said that it bothered him that people really thought he was as dumb as his character, Ted Baxter. That's just a tribute to what a good actor he was, isn't well, he it? He was, and delightful, wonderful. But yeah, it bothered him, and he... And he yeah, because people, that's the only reason they see you. I and mean, then it's hard to do another role for sometimes people get, you know, stuck in a role. And uh, they were, uh, that's the other thing. Everybody in the cast was so great. Valerie and Ed and I were particularly close and everybody was wonderful. I didn't know Sue Ann. I wish I had. I left before she came. Oh, Betty White. Can a writer actually learn to be funny or is being funny an innate talent? Yeah, you can learn the format, but you can't learn to be funny. In fact, it's so interesting. When I was at UCLA, I went to Northwestern in journalism, and I transferred to UCLA because I didn't want to do who, what, when, where. I wanted to be more creative and be in TV. And we didn't have all the things that people have now, uh, script form and stuff like that. I had never even seen a script until I was a graduate student. Francis Ford Coppola was my teacher, and that's where I won the award that you were so kind to mention. But we didn't even know the format. You can be taught all of those things, but you can't be taught how to be funny. You're either funny or you're not. I've always thought that too. When you were writing for a sitcom, Susan, did you ever try to push a character in a different direction than the creators of the show wanted? Well, you know, that's kind of one of the rules when I teach. I, you don't do that because when you go in, they know their show better than you and they don't want to do that. Certainly not the first year, maybe the second or third year, they'll take a character in another direction. But no, you really... And the other reason Mary was such a great show was those characters were so well-defined and you knew that Rhoda would say it like this, but Mary would say it like that. And you knew their voices were so clear. And only later did they like, you know, Mary was so perfect all the time that later they put her into situations where things went wrong and stuff like that. But that comes later. Well, I thought it was interesting that when you wrote a script for Marlo Thomas in That Girl, you were suggesting that they should move her character into a marriage and they decided to keep her as a single woman. I think looking back, they made a mistake. I don't know. My partner and I uh, wrote a That Girl and it, we pitched it. I think they had even said at some point we want to do stories where she and Donald will get married. And then Marlo, who was in charge for the first time, really, a woman was very much involved and in charge of her own show. 
she decided not to get married. She wanted to be the single girl. And so uh, we got paid for our script. It was a funny script. They never shot it. But I, I, I don't know, Harvey. I think, I think it was the right thing at the time. Well, I guess we'll never know. I just thought that they ran out of ideas with her as a single woman because it wasn't an ensemble cast like Mary Tyler Moore, who was single throughout. So, I, they, Yeah, because she didn't have the work-life venue that was as important as Mary's. What do you think of the sitcoms on TV nowadays? You know something? I don't watch them. There are very few. The last thing I watched and loved was Veep. I thought that was brilliant with Julia Louis, Julia Louis Dreyfus. I'm I'm watching the news, which is why I'm so depressed. I think there are certain comics. I watched something the other night that was so fabulous. I want everybody to watch it. HBO. There's a guy named Gary Gullman, who's a stand-up comic who was depressed, and I've been depressed. And his thing it's called Depresh, but he was really depressed. I mean, he went into hospital. It's the funniest. I never laughed out loud. Is what I. Comedy people and I myself, sometimes we watch something and we'll say, oh, that's funny, but we won't laugh out loud. This guy made me laugh out loud through the whole thing. So Gary Goleman, Depresh. All right, we'll check it out. Uh, what I feel is that there's such a large number of reality shows on TV now. It strikes me that those shows make it harder for TV writers to get work. I'm sure that's true. There, there are a lot of outlets streaming and stuff like that, but reality has destroyed television and destroyed America. I mean, if you really want to go there, I mean, started with the Kardashians and I think that's how we got Donald Trump, but that's a whole other story. I think that it's difficult and you know, the writers are on strike now and I, and I support them clearly. The writers always were the lowest on the totem pole and people don't, people think that actors make up their own lines. No, they don't. <laughs> we do. <laughs> so good luck to the writers, Jill. Yes, every writer who's ever appeared on this show has said the same thing, that writers do not get the respect in the industry that they deserve. It's true. It's very true. And financially now, it's very tough to be a writer. And also there's ageism more than anything. The older writers are having problems. When I retired, I retired a long time ago because there was a writer's strike in 90, in 89. Afterward, I tried a couple of things. I, I was in New York then, but I had a, a, a friend who was a guy, I would say he was like 50 and he had a son and they told him, go in with your son and let your son do the talking and then you can do the writing. There's such ageism there. And we won a, an award. We won money from Producers Guild for an ageism lawsuit. It's really disappointing that an industry that should be reflecting the positivity and progress of society is actually full of a lot of archaic thinking. And I mean, in terms of your very interesting relationship with the feminist movement, you've already mentioned the article in TV Guide, you were wearing hot pants, a lot of women took offense to that. And then there was an article in Los Angeles magazine about women writers, and they called you pushy, pushy, pushy. What did you make of that? Oh, not much. I just cried for two days. I mean, my husband had to like, you know, I, could, I was paralyzed crying. And my husband, who was very calm and very together, said, you go out and you get a T-shirt and you write pushy, pushy, pushy on it and you wear it to your meetings. I thought I was just enthusiastic. And also you had to be semi-aggressive to get a job, you know, but LA Magazine called me that. And yeah, it was hard. I still cringe, obviously, when I hear it. The thing is that being a woman in any business, and now still, still there are the glass ceilings, and now the ageism thing too. We haven't we haven't gotten much better. I tried to sell a, a older women show many times, and every time they'd say no, I'd say, "Hey, Golden Girls, it was the greatest." You know what? They still don't want it now. Frankie and Johnny, I think, is the only thing that uh, Lily Tomlin and Jane fond oh, of. Oh, Frankie and Grace. Oh, Frankie and Grace. Yeah, right. Well, you wrote about something you call development hell, which is what happens when scripts you write never get produced. And it can happen a lot. How do you deal with that as a writer, Susan? That would drive me crazy. Well, it drove me out of the business. I was very, very successful for my first show, which was Mary Tyler Moore. So I thought, oh, this is easy. And then <laughs> I wrote a lot of scripts. My first year, I wrote the most, I think, 13, which was the most scripts a new writer had ever done. 
And then my second year, I was getting pilots of my own show. And my third year, I was doing movies of the week. So I thought, wow, this is going to be great. So I did 15 movies of the week. The two that you mentioned were both top 10. I couldn't sell the other 13 I got paid for. They never got made. I did 12 pilots, I think, never got made. I did five movies, features, never got made. And I couldn't take it anymore. That's one of the reasons I quit. I, I retired to New York because it's a terrible analogy, but you put your heart and soul in something. It's like having a lot of little dead creatures on the shelf. It was difficult. It's just heartbreaking. You had lunch with Joan Rivers a few times to discuss the possibility of writing together. Why didn't it happen? You know, I loved her. I was introduced by uh, a mutual friend, a producer. We tried to come up with ideas, but she had so many things going and and uh, I had so many things going. It just never happened, but we remained friends and she was so fabulous. And she did. She taught me something. She said, whenever you go on a show, because I was doing a lot of uh, promotion, TV, radio, whatever, you always practice what you're going to say. You always have some anecdotes in the back of your mind to throw in because otherwise there you are and you're stuck. And so that always reminded me to do that. Whenever I did an interview, I always had a few things I knew I wanted to say. Oh, well, I hope you say them today. <laughs> no, today I'm just winging it. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, when you look at some of the women today in comedy, women like Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Amy Schumer, Mindy Kaling, does it sometimes hit you hard that back when you were starting out, you had no role models? Those are four great women. As a matter of fact, I... If anybody knows Tina Fey, tell her I love her. I read her book. I tried to get in touch with her and she never got back to me, but that's okay. I'll tell her. Okay. No, it's true. And and they all spoke about Mary as being an influence and Amy Schumer is, is brilliant. You know, it was weird because feminism was happening at the same time. And so we were sort of supported by society and that it's okay to be a woman having a husband and a job. It's okay to have a career and to try things. So it all kind of came together. I, I, There were one or two women who had written before, Treva Silverman on Mary Tyler Moore, Joanna Lee on other shows. But I never, I don't know, I just thought it, it, it was something I wanted to do and I was gonna do it. <laughs> you wrote that you never had the imposter syndrome, you had the grown up syndrome. What did you mean by that? The imposter syndrome is you think people are gonna find out you're no good. I never felt that, it's so terrible. I felt I was good. The grown up, I still feel, I'm between 50 and death is what Auntie Mame said. And I feel my favorite age was four and I still am between four and six. And I don't know, but I am. So you don't feel grown up? Cause I still want, I still want someone to take care of me. I still want my mommy and daddy. Yeah. <laughs> But that means that you still look forward to the future then. You still see creativity and adventure in your life. <laughs> Please, God, yeah. This, this is why this last few years with the COVID has been such a horrible and affecting thing. And my shrink said he had like 40, or and I think it's, a, it's an anecdote that, that rings true, but 40% more therapy people are going into. It's just been terrible and isolating. And it's the worst time obviously in, in, in most of our lives between the Ukraine and politics and COVID and there's, there's not a lot to look forward to and it's hard. And that's why Gary Goldman's depression was, it was so good to be able to laugh at being depressed. I mean, as I lay in bed for days watching the show. Well, one of the reasons I loved your book so much is because it also provided incredible diversion, very, very funny. And a good portion of the book deals with your love life, including your Ooh, son. I knew that was coming. <laughs> a good portion of the book does deal with your love life and your sex life. Why was it important to you to go beyond discussing your career and reveal so many intimate details of your personal life? Oh, no. Why did I do that? Oh, my God. Because it was a huge part of my life. I mean, I'll tell you. This is, it's like, can I lie down on the couch, doctor? I'll tell you, when I was 11 years old, I was still wearing an undershirt. I was the only kid in my group that was wearing an undershirt and I was called Sexy Sue. I had no idea what it meant. I wanted to wear a bra. That's why when people burn their bras, I wouldn't burn mine because it took me so long to get one. And I don't know, I just had, I was called that and it was kind of always expected of me. And I was the longest virgin. I was a virgin till I was, 
21 and people yelled at me and stuff. So I don't know. It was just a part of my life, Harvey. Well, is there a lesson or a theme that you want readers to get from reading about your romantic life? I'd like some more. <laughs> Hello, anyone out there? Tall, 65 to 75. Financially independent. Very. Likes Israel, likes to travel. Not a MAGA, obviously. Yeah. All right, we'll we'll uh, we'll see what we can do. I think you've still got a lot of mojo going on. <laughs> I, I want to read you an excerpt from your diary, Susan. You wrote, and I'm quoting you here, part of me is still the little girl. Even though I've had so much success, maybe the little girl is holding back the woman because she's afraid to be too successful, independent, and therefore alone. Wow. So that, that is a sentiment that's been expressed by many, many successful women that I've known. The idea that if you become too successful and independent, no man will want you. What's the answer to that dilemma? I don't even remember writing that. That's wild. Well, you have to pick the, the right guy. I mean, I was very fortunate. My husband was very open, my ex-husband, very open to my career and very supportive. I think we've gone through so much. Women have gone through so much. And if that's still a problem, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like stunned that I wrote that. If that's still a problem, then we haven't come as far as we should have. It's, it's very important to find someone who supports you and with whom you can be equal. I can't imagine now thinking that some guy would be, I mean, a guy of a certain age, if he hasn't achieved his own success and been you know, secure in it, who would want him, frankly? Wow, that's, that's interesting. I'm intrigued that I quoted you something from your book that surprised you. Wow. But may I say one other thing about my book? I did not have sex with Gerard Depardieu. People keep thinking it's, it's not. When you read it, you'll see, please, it's not. Do you think I would go to bed with Gerard Depardieu? Anyway, let's move on. Well, for those who haven't read the book yet, there is a <laughs> French actor who's referred to in the book, but now we know <laughs> you have it from the author herself. It was not Gerard Depardieu. And you're not going to tell us who it was, are you? I didn't think so. <laughs> I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Susan Silver by going to her official website, hotpantsinhollywood.com, and you can follow her on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Well, my dear Susan, I have only one more question for you, and it's very important. Are you ready? Yes. I'm quite sure you must be the only woman in the world who's turned down dinner invitations from Harry Belafonte, Tom Jones, and two invitations from Clint Eastwood. So my question is, Susan, what were you thinking? I know. I don't know. And I will tell you something really weird I was going to post. I've just been catfished by someone who said they were Tom Jones' son and manager. Because I'm a fan of his on the fan book page. And there's a chapter in my book about my quote unquote date with him. And this guy convinced me. And I all I just wasn't a hundred percent sure, so I said, "Well, get me two tickets to the concert in New York," and I never heard from him again. So obviously, it was a catfish. His life comes around. There's a circle. There is. Your friend Lily said, "Put Susan in a room with a hundred millionaires, and she'll come out with the chauffeur." Why do you think that is? Because he'd be the best looking guy. I'm. I'm just so superficial. <laughs> oh, and before we go, I just remembered. There's another question I'm dying to ask you. Tell me what it was like being a showgirl in the movie Viva Las Vegas, starring Elvis oh. Presley and Anne Margaret. Yeah, I write about that. Elvis, yeah, he asked me also, and I write about that in the book. It was really fun. And there's a clip, and I got I filmed the clip. It's like three seconds. I walk by, he and, and some guy are standing at a pool table, and I have an outfit on with a headdress. And I was in college, I was an extra in college, and I walked by, and then afterward, the mafia the memphis mafia six guys that hang out with him came up and said elvis is having a party tonight and we'd like you to come so you can read about it in the book yes that was a very interesting book because i kind of wanted to put myself in your place and all those situations you had and i think that that's part of the fun of reading your book well i was a little frightened jewish virgin what can i tell you <laughs> <laughs> all i know is 
all the way through it, I was saying, what would I have done? What would I have done? <laughs> I got to tell you, it's been such a pleasure meeting you and talking about your incredibly amazing life and career. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Oh, honey, thank you. I love you so much. I love you too. And I can't wait to meet you in person very soon. Very soon. Our guest has been the delicious Susan Silver, whose memoir entitled Hot Pants in Hollywood, Sex, Secrets, and Sitcoms is available wherever books are sold. Don't miss it. You will love it. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin. A very special thank you to my PR director, Lori Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.